allow me to extend my revolutionary greetings and comradely salutations to you all, our viewers and listeners living and working in different parts of the world. Allow me also to extend my greetings to the participants joining me on this panel. I am also happy to introduce to you uh, my special guest today on the talk show, Mr. Piers Pigu, uh, who is a senior consultant for the International Crisis Group, and he is set uh, to give a presentation of one of the latest publications of the International Crisis Group that is entitled, How South Africa Can Nudge Zimbabwe Towards Stability. Mr. Piers Pigu, welcome to the conversation. Uh, thank you so much, Constantine, and uh, thanks for the opportunity to, to have a discussion about something which uh, may not be uh, on the world center stage uh, in terms of priorities, but uh, remains a critical issue uh, in the Southern African region uh, as it relates to the import of the ongoing challenges, uh, social, economic, and political challenges that uh, have been uh, unfolding over many, many years now uh, in, in Zimbabwe. So I pre very much appreciate the opportunity. Thank you. That is wonderful. I'm also very much happy to have you and you are very much welcome. I would like to give you the next 20 minutes uh, to take us through the presentation of uh, this publication. And then I'm going to open the floor for questions and for comments from the participants joining me on this panel. Many others that are, are going to join us uh, and are following the discussion, please uh, just type in your name and your institutional affiliation and we can get to start. Uh, Mr. Piers, this is your time. Thanks very much uh, uh, for, for the opportunity, as I was saying. And, and you know, we may not take 20 minutes because it's always richer to get into the, uh, into the nuts and bolts of, of, of the conversation. But let's, let's see, once I start, of course, time, time may, uh, uh, may pass me by. So do shout if I'm going over time as well. Uh, I'll certainly endeavor not to. Perhaps it's important to start uh, by just giving you a little bit of background about the International Crisis Group and, and you know, what is the merits of a, an international organization uh, making a commentary of this nature on the situation in Zimbabwe. We, we understand in the context of sensitivities around the politics of sovereignty and so forth, there are some that uh, do not like uh, outside organizations to, to make this kind of commentary. I should point out that, that the crisis group have been, which is an international conflict prevention organization based uh, in Brussels, but operating in over 50 countries around the world, uh, has had an interest in the situation in Zimbabwe for the last two decades and has been watching the situation unfolding, trying to make policy recommendations uh, in order to uh, uh, promote a sustainable solution to an ongoing uh, uh, crisis uh, that has now really brought Zimbabwe into a, a very difficult set of circumstances, a political, economic, and social crisis, uh, the likes of which the country has not seen before, uh, and a kind of stasis uh, that has emerged around prospects for uh, actually moving forward uh, towards some kind of inclusive, sustainable settlement in the country. I, as I was saying to you off air before we started, uh, I was listening to a webinar this morning in Zimbabwe, including a number of civil society actors and the politicians are talking this afternoon about prospects for dialogue. And, and one feels sort of kind of stuck in a perpetual deja vu in terms of the issues that are being raised. We, we appear to have a, uh, an ongoing uh, uh, and, and a fairly good understanding of, of the uh, of, of the problems that are in play, although there are very different perceptions uh, of that, uh, depending on, on your vantage point. Uh, but very few pragmatic, practical suggestions being put on the table uh, in terms of a solution-oriented approach. Uh, and, and this is where one, one, one feels a, a stasis of, of uh, 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 the, the ongoing challenges facing Zimbabwe. So, the, uh, uh, the crisis group uh, have been watching, as I said, the situation in Zimbabwe for some time, and, and we decided uh, in the wake of the uh, visits by the ANC and by presidential envoys in, in South Africa to take another look at the possibilities of what South Africa might 
uh, be able to, uh, uh, to, 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 to achieve uh, in terms of promoting some kind of progress in, in, in reform in Zimbabwe. Now, we know there's a lot of background uh, uh, to South Africa's previous roles uh, in the Zimbabwean situation and, and very strong uh, interpretations, positions, criticisms of the role that's been played in the past, particularly uh, under the auspices of quiet diplomacy, uh, notions of, of solidarity, liberation movement, solidarity, and so forth. Uh, but we have seen a pivot and a shift in the South African position, at least from a rhetorical and a public uh, a narrative point of view. This coincides really with a broader shift in South African foreign policy on a number of areas, at least from a rhetorical uh, uh, point of view, uh, following the shift in power dynamics inside the ANC and the elevation of uh, Cyril Ramaphosa to the presidency. A review process was put in place, uh, 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 a ministerial review process was put in place uh, in early uh, 2018, uh, 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 sorry, in early 2018 by the former Minister of International Relations and Cooperation. Uh, and that uh, gave a very clear signal that uh, the new administration of Ramaphosa would be reviewing a number of the issues uh, relating to policy, not just in the foreign policy arena, but also uh, on a range of fronts. Uh, in the wake of Jacob Zuma's presidency. Now, the extent to which there has been an active shift in foreign policy, of course, is, is, is open debate, and there's uh, significant disappointment that things may not have moved as quickly as they could have uh, during the ensuing period. Uh, and that remains uh, very much a subject for internal discussion uh, in South Africa and amongst actors that are interested in South African foreign policy. But we began to see a slightly different take on the Zimbabwean uh, story. Uh, initially uh, in early 2019 from President Ramaphosa who gave a, an interesting speech at the Binational Commission in Harare uh, where he stood up and gave a speech about the range of challenges that were facing South Africa in terms of corruption, state capture uh, and uh, shifting uh, the policy arena uh, and priorities uh, back onto a new track. Uh, he used the South African situation and challenges as a lens in which to say to colleagues in Zimbabwe, we understand you're also facing a set of similar problems and similar challenges. So he was reflecting, as I said, using the South African uh, situation uh, to, to reflect on, on, on the array of challenges in Zimbabwe without directly saying, you know, we see the following challenges uh, in Zimbabwe. This, I think, was a significant message, uh, which may not have been heard by, by many people, but did signal a willingness from uh, the government to actually raise its head and look at issues uh, 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 and, and to talk about some of the issues that uh, uh, had, some of the issues that have traditionally uh, been uh, uh, the subject or of, of, of behind the scenes talking under the rubric of of quiet diplomacy. So the next move that we see is later uh, in the year, in November, when the Minister of International Relations and Cooperation, Naledi Pandor, uh, made a public uh, uh, a presentation uh, at a summit in, uh, an NGO summit in, in Pretoria, in which, uh, which sig signaled a significant shift in, in South Africa's public uh, uh, a presentation on Zimbabwe in, in which she linked the ongoing uh, challenges facing the economy to the political challenges, saying that the two issues were interrelated and you will not be able to resolve uh, uh, Zimbabwe's economic challenges without dealing with the political. She also raised a different take to the traditional solidarity posture that we've seen from South Africa and the region uh, over the last uh, decade or so in relation to the issue of sanctions, no longer simply waving the sanctions and shouting from the sidelines that they must be lifted. These are illegal measures uh, and that they are, uh, uh, they are the reason for Zimbabwe's economic crisis. She moved to a slightly different take saying we need to have a conversation 
about these issues. Uh, we need to be able to go beyond the posturing and the waving of flags to engage on these issues. Uh, and I think that this was a more forward looking approach. How do we resolve this? How do we navigate out of this situation as opposed to uh, sitting and, and holding our entrenched positions on this where we simply point fingers at one another? This was an important shift. We saw subsequent uh, uh, to that a visit to Harare in December by President Mbeki, uh, who came ostensibly under his own steam, but it depends on who you talk to as to uh, why he was there. The Zimbabwean state media said it was a response to a direct invitation from President Mnangagwa. People uh, who met with him uh, uh, were told that he was doing this under his own steam. And certainly from the con conversations I had with people in South Africa, uh, it was seen as uh, with, the, uh, uh, with the blessing of the South African government for Thabo Mbeki to go and have a little nose around to see what the temperature was like uh, in relation to these issues. As we know, he met uh, not only with President Munangagwa and the leader of the NDC Alliance, he met with some other political leaders and some civil society leaders. He also promised to come back. Now, of course, that promise uh, was not fulfilled uh, and he didn't come back. And there are different uh, reasons uh, proffered for that. And we understand that uh, uh, it was made quite clear to him uh, that his uh, initiative was not welcome uh, from the side of the ruling party and from the government. And as a result of that, he did not pursue it. Uh, of course, you know, we're yet to hear formally from Thabo Mbeki what this whole thing was about and, and, and what was happening. The next uh, uh, indicator that we see from the South Africans is the participation of the previous ambassador to uh, uh, Harare from South Africa, Ambassador Mbete, uh, who had been playing a quite active role in the background, trying to get a clearer sense of the different perspectives around the various economic and political challenges facing the country. Uh, he participated in an economic summit in February 2019 hosted by, uh, sorry, for February 2020 hosted by uh, uh, Polad, uh, in which he was very vocal in his criticism about the uh, deficits in economic governance uh, in the country and uh, what this meant in terms of the uh, messages that were being sent to outside players. Uh, it was an important public criticism uh, and again uh, needs to be understood in terms of tying the economic concerns back to the political concerns that uh, his political principal, uh, Minister Pandor, had raised a few months earlier. Then, of course, we enter the somewhat twilight zone, bizarre world of COVID that we've been living in uh, for the last 10 months, 11 months or so. Uh, and it was really uh, uh, during this period where uh, kind of it, it felt as though the options for uh, pursuing initiatives, pursuing real change were kind of put on the back burner. And there was some surprise, I think, when we heard that President Ramaphosa in early uh, August had appointed two envoys uh, to come to Zimbabwe to talk to both the ruling party uh, uh, and uh, well, to, to, the, to President Mnangagwa, uh, essentially, uh, and excuse the noise of the dog barking in the background, uh, 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 that uh, the envoys are in the form of Sidney Mufamadi, a former minister uh, in, in South Africa, also one of the team that worked with President Mbeki uh, during the SADC related negotiation process that fed into the GPA uh, negotiations in 2007, 2008. So someone who with, with some uh, significant insight and understanding of the situation in, in, in Zimbabwe. He was accompanied by Ambassador, uh, sorry, by, by uh, uh, Baleka Mbete, Miss Mbete, the sister of uh, Ambassador Mbete, who was previously the chairperson uh, of the ANC. As we all know from the media, uh, coverage that uh, uh, of this visit, uh, they were unable to meet with the head of uh, the MDC Alliance or any other players. And there was some noise about President 
uh, Mnangagwa's office using protocol as a means of constraining uh, uh, the, the team from seeing other actors in Zimbabwe. However, they left with the undertaking that they would be back and also indeed with the blessing of President Mnangagwa's office uh, that they could return to speak to other players. Since then, they have not been back and there has been no public statement about that initiative and whether it is now completely off the table or whether the door is still open for ongoing discussions. But certainly the South Africans left with the message from the government at that stage that there was limited interest uh, uh, in, in uh, South African uh, engagement. I, I, I'm using the word engagement, not intervention, because I think people use the terminology intervention too liberally. Uh, and this feeds into a somewhat mischievous uh, uh, narrative and interpretation around sovereignty politics. But we can talk about that uh, uh, a little bit more in the Q&A and discussion session. Later that month in August last year, the ANC's National Executive Committee took a decision also based on its concerns about the crisis uh, in, in Zimbabwe uh, to send a delegation to meet uh, not only with its sister party, ZANU-PF, but again, uh, in an unprecedented way to say that we're going to talk to a range of other actors in the opposition and civil society. Now, I have to say both of these decisions took a lot of people by surprise. They weren't expecting uh, uh, either, either track, either from government or from the ANC to emerge. In fact, some people have said to me, well, there was more of a crisis in terms of the concerns that were being raised in January 2019, when we had the uh, post-fuel uh, hike uh, riots and, and violent clampdown uh, and protests and so forth, which led to uh, uh, hundreds and hundreds of arrests, lots of uh, allegations of human rights violations and so forth. And at that time, uh, the Ramaphosa administration uh, uh, was somewhat muted uh, in its criticism of, of the government. What happened in... Uh, July, August last year, uh, whilst certainly uh, of concern in terms of violations that were being perpetrated was quantitatively uh, less significant uh, in terms of violations in play and perhaps in terms of what some may determine as, as the crisis uh, that was unfolding. Uh, the ANC delegation, as we know, came to uh, Harare, uh, met with ZANU-PF, uh, and there were different interpretations coming out of that process uh, 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 and coming out of that with ZANU-PF spinning a line uh, in the post-meeting press statement that uh, the ANC had seen the light now, it had uh, been operating on mistruths uh, and, and, and so forth. And the ANC giving a slightly different interpretation, certain people within the ANC at least, particularly uh, Ambassador Ndiwa Zulu, uh, who, or Minister Zulu, I should say, who, who said that there, there was a very frank conversation that had taken place about the kinds of problems uh, that were in play uh, uh, and, and the need and the importance for, for the pursuit of, of, of dialogue, of talking to the opposition, of finding a sustainable solution to this, to this problem. Now, again, since then, we've not seen uh, uh, any further movement from the ANC uh, there's been no return visit. But I'd like to point out, and I think it's important, it would be good for the discussion process as well, that we've also not seen a public proactive attempt by civil society organizations in Zimbabwe or the government, uh, or the ruling part, uh, sorry, or the opposition political parties to reach out to either of those tracks in South Africa uh, to keep the conversation going. Uh, now, I'm not suggesting that there's a magic wand in play here with South African engagement. But South Africa is now opening the door, has opened the door and, and, and can provide a platform uh, uh, for certain issues to be aired and to be interrogated. Uh, there is also an opportunity for extending that conversation beyond South Africa. And you'll see in our paper, we're, we're certainly suggesting that this is not uh, something that South Africa should be doing on its own and it should be reaching out in the region uh, and beyond to uh, try and A, foster a more uh, candid conversation about the conditions in Zimbabwe and what are the possible uh, routes out of various challenges that are facing 
uh, Zimbabwe. This is certainly not about imposing solutions or intervening in that way, but to perhaps help Zimbabweans uh, in a context where I think there is a general agreement from uh, uh, that, that the, there is not an even playing field in terms of conversation of ideas in Zimbabwe. And we see that the available platforms for those conversations uh, are not being uh, effectively utilized uh, uh, for one reason or another. And the legitimacy and credibility of institutions is a core concern uh, and a, uh, a, an area uh, that is likely to be part of uh, uh, discussions, dialogue and so forth uh, that, that is required. So the suggestions in this paper are, are, are somewhat tentative. Uh, they're about nudging. They're about trying to encourage uh, internal players uh, uh, towards uh, dialogue. But also uh, the other side of this is to try and work with those entities that are implementing measures against Zimbabwe uh, to see if there is a way of connecting uh, the two, to, uh, the, 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 the uh, policy positions of countries such as the United States, uh, the EU and the UK, uh, in particular, uh, in terms of building a roadmap, a credible uh, roadmap uh, that will help uh, navigate a path away from sanctions and restrictive measures, uh, and can also importantly uh, find a way of avoiding the implementation uh, of uh, Zidera stipulations uh, with respect to accessing new lines of credit uh, once Zimbabwe has, has, has actually paid back uh, its arrears. And that's absolutely a critical point. It's, it, it's interesting that we see an overlap between the stated commitments of the Zimbabwean government in terms of its reform agenda and some of the core criteria that are in play uh, with respect to Zidera. Uh, and what we see is, is a missed opportunity uh, for a constructive evidence-based a solution oriented conversation uh, about reforms, the assessment of reforms. We see periodically the government put on the table uh, listings of all the developments around its reform program. Uh, these are, are, are periodically uh, produced by uh, the Minister of Justice, uh, Ziambi Ziambi. Uh, and this forms, you know, the government's own reform framework does provide a useful framework for interrogating uh, the developments that are in play. And, and I think that this has been absent, both in terms of an internal discussion uh, in Zimbabwe uh, and in terms of a discussion between uh, Zimbabwe and some of its uh, more critical interlocutors from outside, particularly certain Western countries. And so that conversation has been absent. And I think we think that South Africa could again help to provide a platform for uh, opening the door for a more candid conversation. Uh, on, on these issues. Uh, again, it's, we're limited in terms of what, uh, 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 what we think South Africa can do. We, we know it's not going to fall into megaphone diplomacy, uh, as Thabo and Becky used to call it. It's not going to sit on the outside and shout and scream at ZANU-PF about issues. But it is prepared, as we have seen, to be more openly critical about its concerns, also about the damage that it feels that, South that Zimbabwe is rendering in the region in terms of, of its economic stagnation, the concerns that it has about what that means uh, for the regional uh, integration and development plans. And of course, you know, the thorny issue in South Africa, which has fed into some of the xenophobia concerns down here about the number of Zimbabweans that are uh, in South Africa and that South Africa is uh, essentially supporting one way directly or indirectly. Uh, and this, is in, this has become more of a domestic political issue of late. And we've seen the language from some of our ministers uh, uh, pivoting towards a uh, indirectly a more, a more critical, uh, critical take on foreigners inside the country uh, and the need for uh, protection of South African interests. Now, they tried to play that out in terms of some of the support programs that were put in place by government during COVID to say uh, that only South Africans would benefit. They would take it to court on that. And of course, the door was opened uh, also to foreign nationals for that. And then we've heard recently, of course, President Ramaphosa uh, talking about uh, 
uh, COVID vaccinations being available to everyone, including undocumented migrants. And I think that's a very positive, uh, a very positive statement from the president, uh, which mitigates against some of the concerns of late around xenophobic tendencies and the government's uh, inability to really uh, temper those uh, in many ways. So obviously things have moved on a little bit since we wrote the report. It's, it's uh, you know, we had made a recommendation and it was late in the day in terms of uh, President Ramaphosa's AU presidency. Uh, we had recommended some kind of uh, grouping of African elders to come to Zimbabwe to have a conversation. Uh, uh, of course, we, I think expectations that a recommendation of that nature would be taken up in the circumstances uh, uh, would always have to be tempered. Uh, so, uh, but what we've also seen is we've seen Ambassador Mbete has finished his time there and he's been replaced. Uh, by Ambassador Joyce Mabudafasi, a former deputy minister, uh, an old guard of the UDF, uh, and a uh, someone who we don't expect to be uh, particularly active or proactive on uh, this stage at the moment. To what extent does her appointment, which is clearly a political appointment, she uh, is not uh, a career diplomat, uh, also, as far as I can see, doesn't have a long history of interaction uh, in Zimbabwe, and of course appears to have been brought out of retirement. She's not young, she's 77, uh, and uh, we're not sure whether that's uh, an appropriate age to be appointing someone to an ambassadorial position, uh, given that uh, this is a situation that requires dexterity, energy, and a lot of proactive engagement. So there are some concerns about the message that this appointment sends uh, in terms of whether South Africa is now turning its back on any prospects uh, of trying to work with different constituencies uh, in Zimbabwe, or indeed to be more proactive in reaching out to support the Munangagwa administration, uh, navigate uh, the international terrain in terms of its own re-engagement strategy. There was some talk, for example, a year or so ago of, of South Africa uh, trying to help uh, scaffold some of the financial uh, 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 financing options for repaying its arrears. Well, things have moved on again, and as we see, South Africa has got its own major financial uh, uh, difficulties at the moment. So it's unlikely it's going to come to the table uh, on that front. But nevertheless, as the hegemon in the region, it still has a big role, uh, we think, to play in terms of indicating the directions that could be taken in terms of helping uh, Zimbabwe navigate out of this political, economic and social cul-de-sac. Thanks very much. Wonderful. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much for the presentation, Mr. Pierre Spigu. Uh, I'm very much happy to have uh, heard you and happy to have listened to this uh, presentation. Uh, my dear participants joining me on this panel, uh, on this discussion, this is the question and answer segment. Uh, I'm also happy to welcome your comments. Um, so those of you who have questions directed to Mr. Piers, please just indicate by raising up your hand or showing me an emoji of a hand that is raised so that I can identify you and then you can ask your question. This is your time. Can, can I also just add to that? We very happy to hear sharp criticism, disagreement uh, on these positions. So, so please don't uh, uh, keep your powder dry hold and hold fire. We, 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 we can only learn from robust interactions and engagements. That, that is wonderful. Thank you very much. So I can see a hand that is raised uh, by Dr. Clements Masakure. So Dr. Clements Masakure, this is your time. Um, th thank you very much. I don't know whether you can hear me. Yes, I can. Yes, I can. And I'm sure everybody can as well. But we can Lovely. see you. Uh, um, uh, thank you very much, um, 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 Piers, uh, for this um, um, wonderful um, presentation on the Zimbabwe crisis and how South Africa can, as you indicated, nudge uh, Zimbabwe towards solving its uh, political um, and economic problems. Um, uh, you are right in, in terms of uh, mentioning that um, the Zimbabwe crisis is now beyond South Africa. You cannot think about um, solving it by just um, um, through South Africa alone. It needs other uh, actors. 
And um, I just want to hear what you think about uh, what Ibo Mandaza just uh, wrote, I think should be yesterday or the day before, uh, when amongst other things, uh, he uh, is he, arguing that we have to think beyond South Africa in terms of uh, resolving the Zimbabwe crisis. And he thinks that the current crisis is more or less akin to what it was uh, about 40 years ago, where it was resolved at least in 78, 79 through a conference. So I would like to hear what you think about this idea that um, we should go beyond South Africa and uh, instead have some form of uh, a version of a Lancaster House conference where almost everything comes in the open and there is a genuine discussion. And this includes other players just beyond South Africa. Thank you. That, that is wonderful. Well, thank, thank you very much for that, uh, Dr. Clements Masakuri. If other participants do have questions, please do indicate by raising up your hand. But now let me give the time to Mr. Pierce to respond. Thanks, uh, Constantine, and, and, and thanks, uh, Clements, for, for, for that question. Yeah, I mean, I think it's 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 uh, indicative in 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 our paper that you know this is not something South Africa could 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 achieve alone. Uh, uh, I mean, as we know, Dr. Mandaza has been uh, pushing for a different approach to to dealing with these issues for some time. You know, through the platform of concerned citizens, pushing for. Uh, the idea of some kind of technocratic national transitional administration, uh, which you know, uh, on, on on face value makes a lot of sense, uh, you know, to sort of kind of reset uh, uh, the situation. I think you know, and this came out in this discussion from the webinar that I was listening in on this morning. Is is the central question in all of this is what interest? What interest it does? The ruling party and government have in a genuine conversation, uh, and what does history show in that respect? We see in the often when when people refer to dialogue in in, in Zimbabwe, they talk about three particular incidents. They talk about Lancaster House, they talk about the Unity Accord in eighty seven, and they talk about the GPA in two thousand and eight. I mean, Ibo is obviously referring to Lancaster House as a more kind of no holes barred, everything on the table uh, kind of issue uh, uh, that, that perhaps led to a, uh, a more balanced, and I put that in parenthesis because there's lots of questions about the uh, asymmetry of power that was in play around Lancaster House, uh, but, but resulted in, in, in a, a more genuine sort of uh, conversation and outcome than we saw in 2000, sorry, in 1987 and 2008, where the dominant, the ruling party was able to maintain dominance uh, uh, through the process uh, and in terms of reinventing itself uh, out of the dialogue. So the dialogue didn't really resolve the fundamental underlying problems, which essentially Lancaster House as a uh, you know, provided the basis for a, a reset from the uh, colonial period and the internal settlement period. So, you know, whilst I certainly agree with Ivo that, you know, a, 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 a wider set of, of, of actors perhaps could be at the table to scaffold a more genuine conversation uh, and more uh, solution orientated process, the central question remains uh, whether uh, the, the, the ruling party has any interest uh, in going down this path. And we've heard the, the trite old saying they're not going to reform themselves out of power, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, question in my mind then becomes, what is it going to take to shift the cost benefit analysis of, of those players inside the ruling party to see the benefit of, of, of a shift in that direction? We saw in 2008, the reluctance reluctantly being dragged into a GPA because their back was against the wall. Uh, as things stand at the moment, whilst there are a host of, of internal pressures, political and certainly economic uh, and social pressures, it appears to me that uh, the ruling party, and certainly we hear in the public, 
rhetoric and its narrative from the state as well. Uh, doesn't see anything publicly wrong with what's going on. Seems to think its own reform program is on course and that it's it's about to uh, uh, to, to re kick its economic recovery. This narrative, of course, seems to be somewhat removed from reality. Uh, but this is not new. We've seen this over the years with ZANU PF making all sorts of, of, of statements which, which don't appear to be uh, uh, reflecting the, the actual situation on the ground. So for me, the, the, that is the critical challenge to Dr. Mandaza's suggestion is how would you get them to come to the table in a way where they might be able to, where they would be prepared uh, uh, ultimately to, to, to cede the grip on power that they have been able to retain. Thank you very much for that response and thank you very much for the question, Dr. Clements Masakure. Uh, I've just seen that we have uh, uh, other participants who would like to ask questions. I saw a hand by Tinashe Nyamunda who's joining us from South Africa. I also saw another hand by Riziki Dustan who is joining us from Kenya. So I'm just going to give, uh, firstly, I'm going to give uh, Tinashe Nyamunda the time to ask and then immediately afterwards, uh, Riziki Dustan, you can ask your question and then you can respond to both the questions, uh, Mr. Pia. So, Mr. Mr. Nyamunda, this is your time. Uh, thank you, Anotida. Um, and thank you for, well, I joined a bit late, so I had the tail end of the presentation, I suppose. Uh, so I hope my question won't be an unfair one uh, on you, Piers. But at what point does a crisis become a crisis? And at what point does it end? Uh, I'm asking this question because there's this whole discourse about the Zimbabwe crisis, whether it's political, economic, or otherwise, and how we can resolve that crisis um, for whatever other alternative there may be. My look at Zimbabwean history is that however we define a crisis, there seems to be crisis after crisis whether it's a crisis during Smith's time because of the palace school, whether it's the crisis under UDI, the liberation struggle, the crisis under Bukura Hundi, uh, the crisis in the 1990s, the crisis after land reform, the crisis following the coup. So my question is, if these kinds of problems are perennial, can we still define them as a crisis? If not, then what is it? Wonderful. Thank you very much for that, uh, Mr. Nyamunda. So, Mr. Riziki Dustan, you can you can get in now. This is your turn. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, Chikumbu and uh, Peers, for a great contribution. Actually, my thoughts have followed the, the, the conversation by Dr. Peers, and I really love his great insights about uh, Zimbabwe as a whole and probably the solutions to the Zimbabwean crisis. I'll put probably three or two questions. One is about which kind of uh, democratic approach or a diplomatic approach will um, South Africa, for example, being a, a big brother in the region or a big sister in the region, in the Sadiq region, offer to the Zimbabwean people without necessarily <coughs> with their, with their <coughs> sovereignty as such. So, because all approaches that probably South Africa will offer towards the Zimbabwean crisis, there is a way that it changes to interfering with their sovereignty as a nation. And uh, as such, then uh, a lot is bound to be lost in terms of uh, the sovereignty of a country vis-a-vis -vis the place of a crisis that probably Zimbabwe has found itself in. I've also read uh, widely about Zimbabwe and, uh, and uh, my thought probably will be that um, why can't Zimbabwe, on the other hand, also spearhead the removal of sanctions, spearhead removal of sanctions from the EU, from the, from, from the EU, from America, and other, other key trading blocks, so that uh, the people of Zimbabwe and their leaders will be, in a way, be allowed to, you know, have visit those key areas or those states or those regional blocks with a view of also opening up their trading uh, market. 
So if, for example, the EU or the, the AU uh, spoke in unison that, um, that uh, you know, we have to really come out strongly and uh, fight for the liberation and the removal of the economic sanctions from Zimbabwe, then we'll be better placed than uh, just interfering with the, uh, with, the, with, the, with the operations. Create an, a working environment for Zimbabwe, then all other factors will be really taken care of. Then uh, I don't know how this can, be, can work, but um, the opposition, majority of the Zimbabwean as uh, past has really explained, majority of the elites have moved to either South Africa or to Europe. Chikumbu might, might be one of them. Of course, of course yes. <laughs> <laughs> so why can't we promote dialogue between the opposition and probably this is where uh, international crisis group should really help us and most, mostly those probably best in South Africa. Why can't we promote uh, dialogue between the opposition and, uh, and the government, uh, mostly within the ZANU-PF and the key opposition parties? also trying in a way to stop or reduce the disagreement within ZANU-PF and promotion of uh, what I could call uh, key democratic uh, principles within, within ZANU-PF to be able to tear of uh, the, the, the divergence of opinion with a view of strengthening the democratic, uh, democratic uh, institutions both within ZANU PF and within uh, within uh, the government of Zimbabwe, so I'll think probably if players can be able to handle more so how best which democratic which which, which diplomatic approach will be best. Is it uh, basically the quiet diplomacy or a proactive kind of diplomacy? Then how best can South Africa, for example, being a big brother? Be able to really iron out the issues of um, disagreements within ZANU PF and within the political space in uh, South in uh, Zimbabwe. If we can be able to achieve that, and South Africa goes ahead to either lobby the EU, lobby the European Union, uh, the, uh, the America, lobby other uh, other countries to remove the sanctions. Then the people or the major, the majority poor of South Africa of uh, Zimbabwe will benefit from uh, the, the the kind of uh, approach that South Africa will take. Wonderful. Thank you very much for those questions, uh, Mr. Tinashe Nyamunda and Mr. Riziki Dustan. Uh, Mr. Piers, this is your time. You can respond, and then I can take another batch of questions. Sure. Thanks. And so let me deal with those in order. And Tinashe, thanks very much for 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 the question. Uh, which is certainly uh, not an unfair one. I mean, I think in many respects, as we saw last year, uh, in relation to the visit uh, from the South Africans to Harare, there was a sort of semantic debate about the issue of crisis. Uh, is it a crisis or is it a challenge? Uh, that is, or are there challenges that are being faced? I mean, I think, you know, we have to be very careful at the International Crisis Group with that. Uh, word in, in, in the name of the organization. And, and it's something that uh, I'm sure won't surprise you that periodically over the years, myself and colleagues are often accused of generating or portraying situations as crisis for some kind of job creation scheme uh, for, for, for ourselves. And we are very conscious about hyperbole in, 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 in these situations. I mean, for goodness, how long have we been hearing from certain people that Zimbabwe is on the edge of the precipice, that it's about to collapse into uh, absolute chaos. Uh, and I think, you know, the fact that this, this uh, hasn't happened in some respects uh, then uh, reinforces a, a contrary position is, of course, there is no crisis. This is a manufactured uh, reflection of reality. Uh, with a political agenda behind it around regime change, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Now, I think in some respects, both of these positions, uh, these polarized positions reflect a fundamental failure to have an honest discussion about the actual situation on the ground. And, and, and I think, uh, you know, this, whether one then interprets particular issues as a crisis or not, okay, is open to interpretation. If you have seven and a half million people 
food insecure in a country that was once a major exporter of food uh, and, and didn't really have domestic uh, food problems, does that represent a crisis in that sector? Does massive informalization of the economy represent a crisis? Does multiple human rights violations uh, and a culture of impunity represent a crisis? Again, you can go through all the different sectors and you can, and you can have discussions about these issues. Whether or not they combine to create a crisis, of course, uh, uh, is, is, is open to debate. But I, I certainly hear what you're saying about how the issue then gets manipulated uh, one way or the other, which I think diverts us from having this more open and honest conversation, which is essentially what we are trying to encourage South Africa to help enable. It's not, uh, you know, it, it, you know, this is something which, which is pertinent to South Africa itself. I mean, internally, you know, with our domestic politics, and this is something we didn't talk about in, in, I didn't talk about in the presentation or haven't responded to, the extent to which the domestic dynamics in, in, in South Africa constrain uh, its ability to, to, to look outside and engage on these issues, as is expected by many people, uh, uh, and and you know the extent to which some of the internal dynamics inside South Africa play out into in 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 relation to how it wants to address the situation in Zimbabwe as well. Uh, I think you know we shouldn't get lost. We know that there are some serious serious problems in Zimbabwe. Again, whether we call it a crisis or not. Uh, uh, you know, is 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 up for debate. Uh, so that 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 for me is is a kind of starting point on that. But I do I do take what you've said to Nash in uh, you know with uh, uh, I think it's an important issue to keep on the table. We shouldn't always be going for the dramatic uh, for the for, for for the key headline because it loses uh, uh, its import, uh, loses its uh, potency. Uh, and, and and credibility. Uh, it's the it's the whole uh, uh, chicken licking sky is going to fall in our head story uh, that eventually people stop listening. But we have seen a widespread deterioration on multiple indicators uh, over the last few years. Some of those are slowing down and arresting, and one hopes that that might be the first indicators of some kind of recovery. But overall, the picture is uh, looking extremely bad. Uh, and, and I think we should uh, not shy away from that. What can South Africa do in the context of sovereignty politics? And I think, you know, that question, Ziki, is, it has a broader application, not only in the Southern Africa region, but, but uh, on the continent and, and, and in terms of, of some of the clunky north-south uh, posturing. Uh, that we see. The politics of sovereignty is, 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 is a critically important one, but we've also seen it employed as a way of frustrating and undermining uh, efforts to criticize governance inside or, or to assess governance uh, and governance deficits uh, and concerns that may have arisen in relation to, to uh, violations of whether it be social uh, and economic rights, civil and political rights, and so forth. Uh, South Africa has uh, traditionally, under the rubric of liberation movement solidarity, kind of navigated very cautiously around sovereignty politics. I mean, we see this in play, for example, uh, uh, in relation to how SADC is, is uh, currently trying to navigate a relationship with Mozambique with respect to, to what assistance it might be able to provide uh, to tackle the insurgency in Cabo Delgado. Uh, and, you know, sovereignty and the rights of a sovereign country to, to, to uh, say, don't interfere uh, uh, is certainly an accepted standard. However, uh, sovereignty, uh, 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 the, the politics of sovereignty has its limitations and sovereignty doesn't rest necessarily in the government per se, it rests in the people. Uh, and therefore, you know, one can get into academic debates around this, uh, but, uh, but I do think that the South African shift uh, recognizes, uh, uh, and certainly by, by repeatedly saying we need to talk to a broader range of people, not just the state and government and, and ruling party, uh, that there is a recognition that sovereignty resides in a much broader spectrum of interests uh, than, than the kind of narrow state government 
a position which is traditionally taken uh, in, in, in this arena. So I think that, that by recognizing that and promoting that, promoting uh, engagement uh, also between civil society groupings from the region and uh, uh, as well. These are the, the, these do not uh, militate against uh, the sovereign interests of, of individual countries. It reflects more the uh, connectivity and the uh, shared values that we can find in terms of sovereignty politics between these countries. So, so I, I, I think this is the route that South Africa can play in terms of providing a platform uh, for, for those discussions, in, which is not interventionist. Uh, but it does recognize fundamentally, because you know we've heard for a long time, Zimbabweans must resolve their own problems. And I think that there is a fundamental agreement on that. I think what's different now is the South Africans, they're not saying it openly, but they have recognized that Zimbabweans will not provide a sustainable solution to their own problems if key parties to that conversation come into the conversation with one or both hands tied behind their back. And this has been the experience that we've uh, uh, seen to date. So how do you even things up a little bit? How do you keep uh, a light shone on certain issues? Uh, uh, but it's not about imposing the agenda. And this is why it's so critical for the agenda to be set by Zimbabweans and why South Africa is not going to come running to the table unless Zimbabweans bring the issues to it. I've long argued that one of the major, uh, and this is a generalized statement, so forgive, forgive me for that, but one of the major problems that we've seen with opposition and civil society politics over the last two decades is that they've spent much more attention and energy on a look north strategy to Washington, to Brussels, to London, and so forth, than to building uh, a relationship in the region. Uh, with political entities, uh, civil society, uh, and membership-based structures, and so forth. And the space for that has always been there. I'm not saying some of that has not happened, but I'm just saying that not enough attention has been given to throwing the grappling hooks out uh, in, in, in that direction. Let me just say a couple of words about sanctions uh, uh, on this. Uh, there is experience from Zimbabweans of navigating uh, existing sanctions that are on the sanctions list off sanctions. And this has been done, uh, this was done in the GPA and after the GPA uh, by the government itself uh, and by uh, some independent businessmen uh, that went to uh, Europe and to the United States to make the argument for the lifting of measures against entities where it was felt and it could be established that the implementation of those measures had a broad-based negative impact on Zimbabweans. You know that the, the argument is made that these are targeted measures, that they uh, therefore do not have broader economic implications. What was argued in these few instances against uh, involving, I think, ZB and Agribank and a couple of others, uh, they were able to make the argument and the measures were lifted. Uh, uh, painful process, particularly with the United States, uh, and we're talking about the US here because the EU measures, uh, as we know, are, are simply against uh, ZDI at the moment in terms of targeted measures. Uh, look, it's very important, uh, Riziki, you understand that these are not trading sanctions. Trade has continued throughout. There has been some chilling uh, impact of these measures in terms of financial arrangements, uh, and we see that banks uh, in particular, are traditionally conservative when it comes to risk assessment on these kinds of issues. So there has been an impact, but it's certainly these are not generalized economic sanctions that you see, for instance, being implemented against Iran or North Korea or Venezuela. So, you know, the, the, the measures have been overstated. Uh, certainly, they do have some import uh, uh, for the economy, and certainly they have an import in terms of accessing uh, cheaper finances, although the primary uh, challenge for accessing uh, 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 more affordable channels of finance uh, relate to uh, Zimbabwe's own financial delinquency and its bad behavior and its record, uh, uh, which is why it's been forced into to, to borrowing uh, at, at rates which are, are somewhat exorbitant. Last word on the, the, and I'm happy to come back on any of those issues in terms of the opposition, uh, yeah, I mean, I think as I, 
as I, as I got a sort of sense today from 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 the discussion that was going on in this other webinar, and I'm referring back to that again, this afternoon was billed as a number of political parties coming to the table, including ZANU PF, MDC A, MDC T, and I think Maduku was there uh, as well. Uh, but at the last moment, the MDC Alliance pulled out of it. Now, I can only speculate as to why they did that. Uh, but uh, I presume it's got to do with not wanting to sit on the same platform as uh, uh, someone from the MDCT. That internal fight uh, is far from over. And as we've seen, the opposition are fragmented. The available platform uh, that the government set up, POLAD, lacks credibility in the eyes of the main opposition movement and many civil society actors. And we've kind of got a status, a standoff, uh, with respect to the promotion of political dialogue. Uh, at one level, and also a broader based dialogue that goes beyond the uh, elite political uh, discussion that's in play. Civil society itself has attempted over the last year to pull together a more coherent platform for civil society engagement, uh, which would at some stage in theory then engage with, with political parties. But that process known as the National Convergence Platform also seems to be in some kind of stasis. So the prospects around internal dialogue and really promoting that, uh, the discussions are going on and it's great to see these webinars happening and so forth, but we're yet to move into a set of pragmatic steps uh, that will lead us uh, 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 to you know, will lead us towards uh, the the constituencies that need to be at the table to be there. And I will go back to my earlier uh, uh, statement about just how interested is the ruling party uh, and government in uh, such a process. And I think, as we can see from uh, their use of Polad and their attitude uh, more generally to a range of other issues around the reform process, which has not been an inclusive process. Uh, uh, I think this, this illustrates quite strongly that they have limited interest at this juncture in pursuing such a, a, an objective. Thank you very much for that response, uh, Mr. Piers. I would like to take another set of questions. Viewers and listeners, I'm still taking questions directed to Mr. Piers. I'm also taking comments. Uh, those of you who are joining us from Facebook and those of you who are joining us right on this panel, please feel free type in your name, your institutional affiliation, and we can get to admit you. So now I've seen a hand uh, that was raised uh, by Mr. Adam Gwaze, who is joining us from Zimbabwe in Marondera, uh, and as well another hand by Dr. Obet Wodzi, who is joining us from the University of Liverpool in the United Kingdom. So I'm going to start with uh, Mr. Adam Gwaze and then get to uh, Dr. Obet Wodzi. Mr. Adam, this is your time. Thank you so much. Can you hear me? Yes, I can perfectly hear you, and I'm sure that the other participants can hear you as well. Uh, that's great. Thank you so much for this opportunity, Mr. Chikumbu and Mr. Pius. Well, I'd like to follow up on the submission you made, Mr. Pius, that, um, which is a very insightful submission, that the problems that we have in Zimbabwe are internal, and the solution itself is internal. Following up on that submission, my question is, what are the, um, if I can say, the most effective institutions that are at our disposal as a Zimbabwean people beyond interme uh, international intermediation, which can bring about this stability? I, I, I love the title of this conversation. It, it's titled as South Africa's role in nudging. <laughs> I like the word nudge. So most of this nudging, uh, ends up with conversations that are buried under a lot of political rhetoric without any tangible change. So my question is, what are the institutions at our disposal as a Zimbabwean people to um, experience or to bring forth this stability, which goes beyond uh, the experiences that we've um, um, incurred from international mediation? A case in point, even the unity government that was ushered in um, in 2009, what I've come to see is that in most cases, these intermediations perpetuate the status quo, where the ruling party remains in power, and times some of the intermediation doesn't really change on the ground. So for us as Zimbabwean people, we are the institutions at our disposal, which we can bring to effect that kind of st uh, stability. Thank you. 
That is perfect, Mr. Adam Gwase. Thank you very much for that question. Uh, Dr. Obet Wodzi, this is your time. All right, thank you very much for allowing me to ask a question. So my question to PS is, um, what would be, I know you, you talked a bit about the cost and benefit analysis. So what would be the benefit for ZANU-PF to resolve whatever crisis is there in Zimbabwe? Because from my perspective, I think ZANU-PF has benefited greatly from the crisis in Zimbabwe. Take imposition of sanctions, for instance. It has benefited ZANU-PF greatly because it has managed them to create an other. So that keeps ZANU-PF together. They have an enemy now they are fighting against. And if sanctions were to be removed today, ZANU-PF would have no excuse why the economy is bad. They'll have no excuse why there are no why there is no medicine in the hospitals and all those things that we're talking about. But as it stands today, the crisis actually benefits ZANU-PF when they know to some extent that if we continue having the same crisis, after every election, the opposition is splitting. So the more elections we have, the weaker the opposition will be. So the crisis is actually benefiting them. And, and I would want to know what would be the benefit for them to, re, to resolve this crisis. Thank you very much, Dr. Obert Wodzi. Uh, Mr. Piers, this is your time. Thanks for, for, for both of those questions. Uh, yeah, uh, Adam, uh, what institutions are, in are available? Uh, well, maybe I could just start with a, with, with a generalized uh, comment because uh, I think, a, a, or a generic comment uh, about uh, peace agreements or deals that are made. What we see inherent in many of them is grand agreements in terms of objectives, uh, but a chasm between uh, uh, what's been agreed in the implementation process. And, and this often reflects the weaknesses of monitoring and assessment capacity within the agreement process, uh, the policing of that, and then accountability structures. Uh, and processes that are associated with that. I mean, we saw this during the GPA where the JOMIC, the Joint Monitoring Implementation Committee, simply became a forum for uh, throwing shade at each other from the three main parties, as opposed to practically resolving them. The guarantors didn't step up to the plate. There were no modalities in place that had been agreed to to that. So I think that, that any process that is kind of agreed to in, to in in whatever institutional framework takes place must have these agreements around policing measures. And ideally, this should be some kind of independent agency to do that. Now, who's going to sign up to that uh, kind of process? And it kind of leads to, in, in some respects, to, to uh, Obert's uh, question about, you know, well, <laughs> uh, does ANUPF have any interest, really? Uh, in in, in uh, moving in this direction in terms of the cost benefit analysis because aren't they benefiting already uh, quite handsomely from the uh, current situation. But before I go back to Obert, I just want to say, well, you know, do we have institutions that are available in Zimbabwe that can play a role to help shine a light? And in many respects, you do still have uh, institutions that may, in the eyes of some and in the eyes of many even be compromise, but still provide a space for raising issues. I, 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 it's very interesting watching the critiques uh, play out, the different emphases that are put out about the role and the potential of parliament and its committees, for example. And of course, they, the, the, that, that varies. There are some committees that have demonstrated uh, uh, in the past some capacity uh, to hold to uh, the, uh, the executive to account, the state to account, uh, and others that haven't. There are some institutions, for example, which remarkably still seem to be relatively well intact, like the Auditor General's office, although uh, uh, Mildred Chiesa's office appears to be consistently underfunded. Uh, uh, the Zimbabwe Anti-Corruption Commission, which I know uh, is criticized by many, has appears to have conducted in, in, in its particular 
set of circumstances, some important investigations and so forth. So there are pockets out there of institutional, and I'm not going to use the word necessarily integrity, but institutional capacity that need to be worked with. I mean, you, 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 I think the likelihood of, of uh, some kind of fresh brand new institutional uh, uh, process uh, or, or competency being put on the table uh, is, is going to be limited. So in the circumstances, unless there is some kind of, 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 of agreement to do something like that uh, between the main players, uh, you're going to have to work with the institutions you've got. And that will mean exposing their limitations when they don't step up to the plate, but also working with them uh, as, as, as hard as possible in order to be able to uh, perhaps have a more nuanced take on some of the, uh, uh, the positive elements of what these institutions can do. But, you know, unfortunately, uh, we've seen ourselves trapped more and more in this polarised uh, debate of... of uh, being for or against something, uh, as opposed to seeing the possible benefits of working with institutions that may be compromised in some way. Uh, but this is, I suppose, uh, in terms of the, sort of the politics of incremental progress, the, the potential of incremental progress. And, and, and I think this is an important way of, of slowly building and consolidating at different levels. Uh, and trying to demonstrate much more clearly what's working, what's not working, and who is accountable, and what and what and where there needs to be greater transparency around improved governance. It's not sexy stuff. It's not leading uh, to uh, magic. This is not magic bullet stuff that's going to to, to provide uh, automatic or immediate relief in many ways. This is a long, slow grind. Uh, to try and, 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 and work towards some common objectives. And this leads me to turn to Obert's question about cost benefit uh, and, and so forth. And I tend to agree with you that, that there are significant, powerful entities within the ruling party and its allies uh, who are benefiting from the current situation. Uh, but I think the challenge for, for the ruling party uh, is its ability to service its patronage networks. Uh, and whether or not it will be able to translate that patronage uh, and its incumbency uh, into always securing the electoral results that we've seen it's been able to secure to date. That's an ongoing question uh, uh, for many people, and there are opportunities from civil society and from the opposition to temper uh, what some have called the smart rig uh, in the way that uh, uh, ZANU-PF has has successfully been able to manipulate the electoral playing field uh, to its advantage. Uh, how do you shift uh, uh, certain individuals? Well, you know, sometimes it's hard grunt work. I was in a, uh, I don't, you may have been there, Robert, uh, in, a, in, a, in a webinar some months back where people were talking about what prospects are there to really build dossiers against uh, certain individuals in terms of, uh, the ICC or criminal justice related issues, you know, to what extent can these be used as pressure uh, to divide and rule from the outside? There's all sorts of possible strategy and tactics that could be employed to scaffold a, a more intense focus on, on certain individuals within government. But in reality, I don't actually see that happening. I don't see the appetite for it. And I'm not sure personally uh, that it would be the appropriate way to go, because I do believe that it would feed into what you have indicated, that uh, they are beneficiaries of crisis, uh, ZANU-PF, that uh, uh, it benefits from a weakened population uh, through divide and rule and so forth. Personally, on the sanctions issue, I think, I think you know, those implementing them are trapped in the, in the world of damned if they do, damned if they don't. I am quite sure, and I've heard this argument many, many times, that, well, if ZANU-PF didn't have sanctions to blame, uh, you know, they wouldn't have anywhere to point. Well, we know that they would spin the legacy of sanctions for the next 20 years uh, as being the reason uh, uh, for the economic crisis. So I, I think, you know, one way or the other, lifting sanctions uh, is not going to mute <laughs> that argument. Uh, the fact that it has still so much traction on the basis of such limited empirical evidence is astonishing. And, and, and I think one of the concerns I have is that those implementing them, but also those inside Zimbabwe that see this have not really taken up these arguments and, and pushed back adequately. I think there's a kind of a resignation 
to the kind of bullying that we see in the theater of ideas. Uh, we see that playing out with the way that uh, certain people uh, just resign themselves to being insulted by Bakarashi on, on, on social media and don't push back. I was delighted to see uh, that appalling individual Matigari uh, uh, being uh, blocked on Twitter uh, by, by Twitter for, for, for bad behavior as a result of people eventually pushing back. Uh, you know, it, it's the hard grunt work that needs to, to happen. And I do believe that there are a range of opportunities here that will contribute to helping uh, a meeting of minds that, that will move us beyond uh, the kind of polarized narratives that we are, we are trapped in at the moment. Uh, I, I think this is absolutely essential. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Pierce, and thank you very much, my dear participants, for the questions that you have raised and the comments that you have shared all those people that have uh, made their comments on our Facebook page and on our YouTube channel. Thank you very much for your participation. Mr. Pierce, let me also take this opportunity to thank you for your participation and for giving this uh, interview. This is the platform where I get to sit with established academics and non-academics as well uh, to have a discussion of their outstanding publications and other top issues of the day. I'm very much happy to have heard you. Uh, have a good day. That, that is okay. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you.